Thanks very much, Joe. Uh, it's great to be here again. Uh, I was here about a year and a half ago for the Trouble with Christmas, and I really look forward to being with you approximately 14 months from today when I'll talk about the Trouble with Arbor Day. <laughs> hey, you ever think about it? I mean, we all know of somebody who was crushed by a falling tree. Think about it. They're death from above. But uh, on, on a semi-serious note, but only for a moment, uh, I, after the presentation, please don't all mob the table while I'm talking. Over on the table there, I have a variety of items. The good news is everything that's not a book is free, including issues of free inquiry. If you've never seen the magazine before, uh, help yourself, take it home, read through it. And amazingly, there are subscription cards inside. We think of everything. And, of course, the, the Department of Reckless Commerce, we, we will be offering copies for sale of The Trouble with Christmas. Uh, my latest science fiction novel, The Messiah Game, which just came out from C-Sharp Press last week, and I have one copy of the new encyclopedia of unbelief. And in the highly unlikely event that more than one person wants it, we will have a bidding war. <laughs> okay, The Trouble with Easter. You know, some people think that because I'm an atheist, I don't understand what Easter is all about. And not so, I say. And let me demonstrate to you that I understand the true meaning of Easter. <clears throat> On the first Easter morning, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ awoke in the darkness of the tomb where he had been placed following his crucifixion. Calling upon the powers of heaven, he summoned an angel to roll the stone away or fling it away so high it would never come down or something. The countryside outside Jerusalem spread out before him, all rolling hills and palm trees and olive groves, painted in lovely muted pastels by the rosy beams of the morning sun filled with love for all men, and excited that his sacrifice had reopened the doors to universal salvation, Jesus Christ took his first tentative step outside the tomb. He saw his shadow, and there were six more weeks of winter. <laughs> so let's not hear anybody else saying that I don't know the meaning of Easter. Okay, this next story is true. The camera shop I do business with in Buffalo, it's owned by a devout evangelical Christian. And recently this businessman posted signs to warn his customers that the business would be closed on Good Friday. And the signs chosen by this devout evangelical Christian to announce that his business would be closed for Good Friday bore a single large illustration, a drawing of, you guessed it, a gaily decorated egg go. The American Jewish writer Philip Roth once quipped that his eminent co-religionist Irving Berlin had, on behalf of the world's Jews, gained clever revenge on Christianity by writing his immortal songs White Christmas and Easter Parade, transforming Christianity's two most holy festivals into, respectively, a holiday about snow and a fashion program. And then there's this. Have you ever seen such an ugly Easter bunny? <laughs> I mean, if this won't scare you away from paganism, I don't know what will. And there's this from an actual church bulletin. The Fellowship Mission Church is having an Easter candy sale. Items include flat bunny rabbits, Jesus on a cross, small crosses, praying hands, bunny with egg, Lambs, bunny suckers, solid lambs, duck sucker, <laughs> big peanut butter egg, etc. Uh, I never recall anything at Easter time having to do with ducks. <laughs> to say nothing of having to do with ducks and sucking. So, but okay, let's get serious. You have a question. Yeah, back to the tomb. Behold, what did the women see? Did they see a rabbit laying eggs? 
So what is this thing called Easter? Well, perhaps familiarity has bred not really contempt, but a myopic underestimation about what a peculiar and contradictory holiday this really is. <coughs> Typically, Easter is held to be the most important feast day on the Christian calendar. So why is it that all the world's Christian churches observe it on the same day, only one year in four? We'll hear more about that. In Catholic practice, Easter is observed on the first Sunday, following the first full moon, following the first day of spring. Well and good, but what does the full moon have to do with the reckoning of a Christian holiday? What does the first day of spring, more properly the spring equinox, have to do with it either? These elements seem pagan, not Christian. Is it that the only place they appear in Christian practice is in the traditional protocol for establishing the date of what's supposed to be Christianity's holiest day. Well, the trouble with Easter is that hardly anyone understands it. Christians who understood it better might care to rethink their commitment to this conflicted, inescapably pagan holiday. Atheists, freethinkers, and secular humanists, folks like us who are no more adherents of a pagan faith than we are Christians, should have been out the door way ahead of them. So how will you observe this year's Easter holiday? And after this presentation, you may be inclined to answer from a safe distance. <laughs> so, the two big questions. Where did Easter come from? And is it too late to send it back? <laughs> Let's examine Easter's earliest origins. The first thing we have to realize is that the holiday we know as Easter is very old. Parts of it are probably lost to history. Surely the recognition of the spring equinox as the boundary between winter and spring in northern latitudes, and the rebirth of living things that it ushers in, including the renewal of crops, Surely these things did far back into prehistory. In Mediterranean lands, the spring equinox was about the time when crops first sprouted. In more northern climes, it was the time to sow seed. Small wonder, then, that the coming of spring has been associated with fertility and rebirth. But when did this all begin? Well, the earliest reference to a spring fertility observance comes to us from Assyria, circa 2400 BCE. The city of Ur, mentioned in the Old Testament as Ur of the Chaldees, apparently had a celebration dedicated to the moon and the spring equinox, which was held sometime during our March or April. To this day, the remaining Zoroastrians around the world continue to observe No Ruz, the new day or new year, on the spring equinox. And that's in line with a lot of native, with a lot of early and ancient traditions that mark the start of the new year in the spring, not in winter. No Ruz may be the oldest continuously observed celebration in the history of the world. So maybe my next book should be The Trouble with No Ruz. Maybe I should go for the custom. <laughs> Well, the Chaldeans venerated a goddess named Ishtar, consort of the sun god. Now, Ishtar and the sun god had a son, Tammuz, who died yearly, was resurrected, and thereafter reigned as his mother's consort. Well, that's a little pink. <laughs> the festival marking the resurrection of Tammuz was also named Ishtar, like his mother slash consort. Although linguists believe the original pronunciation was probably closer to our word Easter. Now, one tradition had it that Tammuz was killed by a wild pig. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is what you get when you come out for a Tom Flynn lecture. Not everyone, not everyone has police lineup pictures from ancient Assyria. But we got it here. So Tammuz was supposedly killed by a wild pig, and scholars believe that by a convoluted path, this led to the association 
of the Easter holiday with pork products, suggesting that our traditional Easter ham goes all the way back to the Chaldeans, which would explain a lot about some Easter ham I had about three years ago. <laughs> Well, the Babylonians knew Ishtar as Astarte, the consort of Baal, the sun god. Now, by these names, Astarte and Baal were both condemned as demon gods in the Old Testament. Yes, that's true. The early Hebrews did not like competition. Well, during their long captivity in Babylon, the Hebrews actually absorbed this ancient Babylonian holiday and the cult of Astarte, probably why they were so eager to stamp it out when they got out on their own again. Many scholars believe that the Jews derived their own spring equinox celebrations, the Feast of Weeks and, yes, Passover, in part from the Babylonian Spring Festival. Now, across the ancient world, spring religious festivals centered on myths of a god or goddess whose own death and rebirth symbolized the death and rebirth of life during this time of year. Now, among other things, this was a metaphor, of course, for the crops that died and went to seed in fall, seed that was reburied in the earth and came back to life in the spring. And several legends, several of these legends spoke of the dying god descending into the underworld to challenge the dark forces there. Attis, the consort and son of the Phrygian fertility goddess Sibylle, was among the most popular such gods. It was believed that Attis was born of a virgin, and each year he died and would be reborn. Each year, Attis would be ceremonially killed on a Friday, and his resurrection marked on the following Sunday. Hmm, does any of that sound familiar? In other cultures, Attis acquired such names as Osiris, Orpheus, and Dionysus. Currently, modern Wiccans and Neo-Pagans celebrate Ostara on the spring equinox. So we see that from ancient times until today, Easter, supposedly the most sacred Christian holiday, really wears its pagan baggage on its sleeves. And we'll see more proof of this as we contemplate the great name game. According to that redoubtable 8th century Christian scholar, the Venerable Bede, the name Easter was likely derived from Estra, the name of the Anglo-Saxon lunar goddess, also known as the Great Mother Goddess. And on what day did Anglo-Saxons venerate Estra? On the first full moon following the first day of spring almost exactly the way Western Christians calculate the date of Easter today. Now on that day, Esther was believed by her followers to mate with the sun god, conceiving a child who would be born nine months later on Yule, the winter solstice, which falls on December 21st. Yes, both of our principal Christian festivals, Easter and Christmas, share this particular pagan root. One of Esther's most important symbols was the hair, obviously on account of its great fertility. Another key symbol was the egg. Now, don't have to work very hard to figure out how an egg could be linked to the idea of new life. Now, we don't know whether the Babylonians dyed eggs and ate them as part of their festival, but we know that that tradition was already long established among the ancient Egyptians and Persians. By New Testament times, colored eggs were familiar across the Mediterranean as symbols of fertility, rebirth, and abundance, and as symbols of the sun. Of course, the hare and the egg continue to play important roles in modern Easter celebrations. Curiously, they're also symbols that that great synthesizer, Christianity, never fully incorporated into its own mythology. They just kind of rattle around uneasily around the edges of Easter and never, you know, they're there, they're part of the holiday, but nobody can really explain what they have to do with this whole Jesus story. Perhaps they were too ancient, too deeply rooted for even Christianity to absorb fully. 
One early attempt to fold the egg tradition into Christian lore was a legend that Mary Magdalene once had an audience with the Roman Emperor Tiberius, at which she gave him a red egg, which she said symbolized the resurrection. Well, the early Christian church was great at absorbing popular pagan observances and making them its own. And uh, in just the same way that a hundred or more Mediterranean sagas of a god-man who was born of a virgin contributed to the composite figure of the baby Jesus in the manger, a great number of pagan and Jewish traditions about the moon, fertility, death and resurrection, and a man-god redeemer would influence the development of the Christian festival of Easter. Well, sort of Christian. And sort of not, as we'll see when we probe the links between Easter and Jewish tradition. Tradition holds that the Last Supper was an observance of the Savior meal associated with Passover. Now, the Hebrew, the Hebrew word for Passover is Pesach, a word that is echoed in the Orthodox Christian word for Easter, Pascha, and also by Western Christian traditions that speak of the risen Christ as the Paschal Lamb. Passover was held on the 14th day of the Hebrew month of Nisan. <laughs> now, Nisan was... Oh, wait a okay. minute. <laughs> Nisan was... Nisan was the first month of the Hebrew calendar. A calendar that, like ancient calendars, began each year in the spring. According to the Jewish calendar, each month began with the new moon. So since Passover fell on the 14th of Nisan, it would always coincide with the full moon. Now keep that in mind, this is going to crop up again. Now, solar and lunar months don't match up, and religious festivals would begin to fall in the wrong seasons, if not for the adoption of so-called intercalary days or months. We're all familiar with the system that adds a leap day every fourth year except at the turns of most centuries. Ancient Jewish timekeeping used a uh, somewhat more intricate system known as the Metonic Cycle. The Metonic Cycle, named for a Greek thinker named Meton, calls for, you can write this down if you like, 235 lunar cycles in every 19 years. This results in an extra month added in seven of those 19 years. <laughs> now, this was also complex that not even the Jews could deal with it easily. In fact, carrying out the necessary calculations was one of the prime responsibilities of the Sanhedrin, the priestly council based in Jerusalem. And they kept their method a deep, dark secret. It was kind of like their full employment program. So in the early days, Jews and Christians alike had to get the date for Passover each year from the Sanhedrin, or after the destruction of the temple, they had to get it from the Sanhedrin's less tightly organized successors. So it's pretty easy to see why Christian leaders would gradually find their own ways to keep track. And so it's easy to see why Jewish and Christian timekeeping would gradually drift apart, gradually decoupling Easter from Passover. There were other factors. Now recall that Passover always coincided with the full moon. Now as early as the third century, Christians were carving out distinctive identities separate from the religion's roots as a Jewish sect. Now note that I said identities, plural, as in more than one. The Christians of the East maintained that Easter should coincide with the full moon, as Passover did, and hence always fall on the 14th of the lunar month. Western Christians, noting that Jesus rose on a Sunday, plumped for a system in which, come what may, Easter would always fall on a Sunday. Eager to prevent a schism between East and West, a schism that happened anyway later on, Church Fathers convened the Council of Nicaea in 325 in part to, se to settle this controversy about when Easter should happen. The council decreed Easter to be the first Sunday after the first full moon following the spring equinox. There was one exception 
If the full moon fell on a Sunday, Easter would fall on the following Sunday. Now, that formula sounds pretty familiar, but we have not quite yet arrived at the modern method for dating Easter. In fact, the Nicene method wouldn't serve the whole Christian world, even through the rest of the 300s. In fact, by 387, the dates of Easter in France and Egypt had drifted 35 days apart. Around 465, the church adopted a method proposed by an astronomer named Victorinus, who had been commissioned by a pope whose name I swear I am not making up, Pope Hilarius. <laughs> yes, there really was a Pope Hilarius. He reigned from 461 to 468. He succeeded the unhumorously named Pope Leo the Great, and was succeeded in his turn by the somewhat humorously named Pope Simplicius. Now, Hilarius hoped to reform the calendar and fix the date of Easter into place, and elements of the myth that he imposed remain in use today. But the British and Celtic Christian churches refused to accept these changes, triggering a bitter dispute with Rome in the 7th century. Whatever its origins, Easter was firmly established in Christian tradition prior to the 4th century CE. In fact, Easter and Pentecost, which fell seven weeks later, were the earliest holy days to be venerated in the Christian community. Though already well established, Easter was singled out in 325 by the Council of Nicaea as the principal Christian holy day. Almost as ancient are Pentecost and the Feast of the Ascension. Now, Pentecost marked the supposed manifestation of the Holy Spirit to the apostles and their followers. It was originally observed 50 days after Passover, which is to say 50 days after Easter. In fact, Pentecost in Greek means 50 days. Later, it was trimmed to 49 days. <laughs> That is exactly seven weeks after Easter, so that Pentecost would fall on a Sunday. Nonetheless, they never changed the name, and it still means 50 days, even though you really only get 49. Now, Pentecost appears in church records as early as the second century CE. It won formal recognition in the third century. By comparison, Lent entered the tradition later not taking its final form as an interval of 40 days of fasting and atonement until about the 8th century of the current era. 40 is, of course, a magical number that appears frequently in the Bible. For example, it's the number of days that Moses, Elias, and Jesus each spent in the desert. You know, you think by Jesus' time they have it down and he could get everything done in 37 days, but no, 40 was the number. Now, 40 days is about five and three quarters weeks, 5.71428 for you sticklers out there. But you've probably figured out that when it comes to Easter, nothing is ever that precise or that simple. For Roman Catholics, Lent lasts not 5.7 weeks, but six and a half weeks. Because Sundays, do not count toward the canonical length of 40 days in Catholic reckoning. Among Eastern Orthodox Christians, Lent lasts eight weeks because they don't count Saturdays either. <laughs> the interval of 40 days must be counted out Mondays through Fridays only. Well, it's worth noting that the word Easter appears only once in the King James Bible. In Acts chapter 12, verse 4, and the reference is disapproving. It tells of the evil pagan king Herod, who seized the Apostle Paul during the days of unleavened bread, that is, at the time of Passover, hoping to curry favor with the truculent Jews over whom Herod ruled. Herod intended, quoting now, after Easter to bring him, that is Paul, forth to the people for trial. So we see in this passage that Easter was then viewed as a festival observed neither by Christian nor Jew, but only by despised pagans like Herod. That's right in the King James Bible, which, of course, we all know is written in the same English that was spoken by Jesus. <laughs> you know, you 
to take, you got to take certainty where you find it. Okay, well enough kicking around the ancients. Let's examine the roots of our modern Easter observance. Around the year 1500, German children awaited the arrival of Oskarhaus, a rabbit who would lay colored eggs in nests to the delight of their discoverers on Easter morning. This custom came to America with the first German settlers in Pennsylvania, not too far from here, and it's the root of our American Easter Bunny tradition. He may look harmless, but don't be fooled. The American tradition of egg rolling can be traced to both England and Germany. In both countries, children rolled eggs down hills on Easter morning, symbolizing the rolling away of the rock from Christ's tomb. It was Dolly Madison, wife of the fourth U.S. president, who brought egg rolling to North American shores, and it happened in a most peculiar way. Uh, during the Madison administration, the uh, central part of the U.S. Capitol building had just been completed, and every American who read the newspapers knew all about the Roman and Greek and even Egyptian influences on its design. The papers of the day were full of that. Well, someone had once told Dolly Madison that Egyptian children used to roll eggs against the pyramids. I'm trying to figure out how that works. Seems to me like you'd wind up with a bunch of yucky egg-covered pyramids. But nonetheless, somebody told Dolly Madison that was how things had been. So she invited Washington children to roll eggs down the lawn around the Capitol. And it's unclear whether she even knew that this was a tradition with Christian roots. Well, the egg roll became very popular. It was held every year except in times of war. In fact, it became so popular that during the Gilded Age, officials at the Capitol complained that the huge crowds were ruining the lawn. So in 1880, President James Buchanan, and this is, I guarantee you, the only time you'll ever see a picture of James Buchanan in a show about Easter. He invited the festival to the White House, where it's been held ever since, again, except in time of war. And today, Easter is still the only day each year when members of the public are allowed to stroll the White House lawn, that is, if they're accompanied by a child. Okay, the most recently emerging Easter tradition is a trend toward exterior house decorations, much like those at Christmas. These days, even normal people tie colored eggs to their trees, hang colorful flags depicting rabbits or eggs, and string egg-shaped colored lights along their eaves. These commercially made strings of, yes, Easter lights, have their parallel in the no less ridiculous strings of jack-o'-lanterns and ghost-shaped lights marketed at Halloween time, which just goes to prove that you can sell Americans virtually anything. Now some folks just get rid of the middleman and just nail a large stuffed bunny to a tree. <laughs> uh, that is itself an interesting admixture of symbols and I have no idea what it means. Other than, hey Bugs, what's up Doc? You are. But now let's return to the duel of the dates because we've only scratched the surface about how wacky the dating of Easter really is. <clears throat> now, Christians believe the resurrection of Christ was the most sacred and awe-inspiring event in history. So you think the God who laid the foundations of the world could have contrived matters so we'd all commemorate this sacred event on the same day. But Christians don't. A bit of strangeness that has reverberated down to our own day from the deep past. Roman Catholics and Protestants used the Gregorian calendar introduced by Pope Gregory the 13th in 1582. And with the adoption of the Gregorian calendar, for the first time Christians all across Europe celebrated Easter on the same date. When England and Ireland belatedly accepted the Gregorian calendar in 1752, all of Western Christendom finally shared a common date for Easter. But Orthodox Christians were even slower to accept the Gregorian calendar, and they still use the older Julian calendar for computing the date of Pascha, their Easter holiday. So Western Christians and Orthodox Christians 
frequently observe Easter on different dates, sometimes as much as five weeks apart. The two groups celebrate on the same day only about one year in four. So, when the hell is <laughs> Easter? In the two previous years, this is very unusual, but in the two previous consecutive years, there was little disagreement. Last year in 2011, April 24th, was the big day all across Christendom. As it happened, 2010 was the same way, April 4th in both traditions. It's extremely unusual to see the dates coinciding two years in a row. Three years ago, they fell a week apart, with Western Easter on April 12th and Eastern Easter on April 19th. Now, 2008, there was a humdinger. In 2008, Western Easter fell on March 23rd, while Eastern Easter didn't happen until April 27th. Feast your eyes on that spread, five weeks. That's as far apart as they get. So how about this year? Well, the West marks Easter on April 8th, and the East on April 15th, a week apart, just like in 2009. Now, Christian leaders have long recognized what a disturbing message this sends. So here's a short history of recent efforts to reconcile the differences and establish a single universal date for Easter each year. Now, there have been efforts that went even further, striving to cast aside all that stuff about the first full moon and the first day of spring, and establish a fixed date for Easter. Much as we all observe Christmas on December 25th. Oh yeah, except for the Orthodox Christians who observe it on January 6th. Well, never mind. <laughs> as we examine the history, keep in mind that this is apparently a tough problem. So I'll try and do this just as rapidly as I can. In 1920, the Patriarchate of Constantinople suggested that the Orthodox churches discuss a common date for Easter. In 1923, the Pan-Orthodox Congress, I hope none of you missed it, decided to revise its calendar. This prompted several schisms among the Orthodox churches, suggesting that the whole thing hadn't been a good idea. Also in the 1920s, some secular groups proposed a fixed date for Easter. The Sunday following the second Saturday in April was one suggestion. These proposals collapsed in the face of innumerable objections. Orthodox churches resumed discussion in 1961 during preparations for the Great and Holy Council of the Orthodox Church. The Roman Catholic Church discussed a common day during the Second Vatican Council in 1963. Nothing was decided, sparing later popes the effort of having to reverse the decision. Since 1965, the World Council of Churches has discussed the topic repeatedly. Well, there's a surprise. In 1997, the World Council of Churches and the Middle East Council of Churches sponsored a meeting in Aleppo, Syria. Participants included, well, all of these folks. Did everybody get that? <laughs> Here, okay. Da, 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 da. That's enough. Okay, that group, all those people, issued what has since been called the Aleppo Statement, acknowledging that no single fixed date for Easter is practical but urging churches at least to calculate the date based on the actual date of the full moon and the actual date of the spring equinox, not on their values and traditional calendars, which may differ by one or several days. In October of 1998, all of these organizations endorsed the Aleppo Statement. In 1999, the Anglican Communion's Lambeth Conference commended the Aleppo proposal for consideration by member churches. A whole bunch of churches, though of course not all of them, endorsed the proposal in principle, which means they didn't have to do anything about it. In 2000, a dialogue established by the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America and the Standing Conference of Canonical Orthodox Bishops, say that three times fast, in the Americas, recommend an adoption of the Aleppo Statement. Efforts to establish a fixed date in a year when Eastern and Western Christianity observe Easter on the same day were announced in 2001 and 2004, but they came to nothing. Though the dates chance to agree once again in 2010 and 2011, 
No one even attempted the fool's errand this time around. And that is the long and futile history of trying to iron out the date of Easter. And I'm sure we'll be hearing much about it for years to come. Okay, now for the part everybody's waiting for. Let's unearth some embarrassing facts about miscellaneous Easter traditions. I know you guys were all sitting around your breakfast tables going, ah, we're going to go hear Tom Flynn talk. I can't wait for the embarrassing facts part. <laughs> Here it is. Hot cross buns are generally observed to be of Saxon origin, though some scholars trace the tradition all the way back to the Chaldean cult of Tammuz, whose followers ate sacred cakes inscribed with what we would now recognize as the letter T. As for the Saxons, they marked the spring equinox, and why not, by sacrificing an ox. The ox's horns became symbolic of the festival, and bakers incised a pictogram of them onto their cakes. Well, when Christianity came along, whether the symbol was understood as a T or as the ox's horns, it was easily enough reinterpreted as a cross. And by the way, the word bun comes to us from a Saxon word meaning, sure enough, sacred ox. So next time you have a hamburger, you're having ground beef on an ox. Think about it. Okay, how about Easter lilies? Long venerated before the Christian era, lilies were venerated as a symbol of the reproductive organs. But here's the wacky part. In the ancient world, lilies were generally seen as a phallic symbol which is pretty odd since for moderns the lily is almost always seen as a symbol of female sexuality. So I don't know what the ancients were into, but that's how they viewed lilies. <laughs> how about that Easter sunrise service? If it smacks to you of sun worship, you're not far off. There was a long-standing pagan custom to greet the sun on the morning of the day on which the length of daytime would equal that of nighttime. The Old Testament book of Ezekiel, chapter 8, contains a description of an apparent pagan solstice sunrise service, which Jehovah helpfully described as an abomination that filled him with wrath. Okay, well, we've had our fun kicking Easter around on account of its all too poorly camouflaged pagan roots. But when we move into the four holy gospels, which we are told present divinely inspired accounts of Christ's death and resurrection. Surely then the rude jangle of discourse and contradiction must cease. Surely the Gospels offer us a single seamless account of the momentous events that Christians view as the spiritual pivot point of all history. Well, not quite, as we'll see in the discourse that I'll call Gospel Frictions. By the way, for the material in this section, I gratefully acknowledge the assistance of a Canadian colleague, Terry Miosi, whose lengthy presentation on Gospel Resurrection Contradictions was the best attended and best loved Good Friday presentation we've ever had at the Center for Inquiry Bank in Amherst. And it's not every year that we have Good Friday presentations, but when we did, Neosis was hands down the winner. Well, we shouldn't really be surprised that the resurrection stories in the four Gospels disagree with one another. The Bible doesn't have a really good track record at being internally consistent. I mean, after all, chapters 1 and 2 of Genesis present two largely contradictory accounts of the creation of the universe one after the other. And then those of you who saw my trouble with Christmas presentation may recall that only two of the four gospel evangelists ever said anything about the birth or infancy of Jesus. Mark and John started with Jesus already an adult. Only Matthew and Luke ever bothered telling the nativity story. The gospels of Matthew and Luke present incompatible genealogies of the baby Jesus that trace Jesus' ancestry from King David down through Joseph the carpenter. Now this is especially impressive since according to the dogma of the virgin birth, Joseph was not the father. But leaving that detail aside, Matthew and Luke managed to disagree 
not only on the number of generations between King David and Joseph, but they disagreed on the name of Joseph's father. They disagreed on the name of Joseph's grandfather. In fact, they disagreed on the names of every single ancestor of Joseph the carpenter, all the way back to an obscure Old Testament patriarch named Zerubbabel. So we shouldn't be surprised that the four gospel resurrection stories, and fortunately all four gospel evangelists did get around to writing about the resurrection, we shouldn't be surprised that they all disagree. And they don't just disagree, they practically fight with one another. In fact, so profound, so total, are the disagreements between the gospel resurrection stories that Dan Parker of the Wisconsin-based Freedom From Religion Foundation routinely challenges Christian apologists to sit down with the four gospels and construct a single coherent narrative of the events surrounding the resurrection that incorporates every significant story point from every gospel, omits nothing, and never contradicts itself. Sometimes he's put up money He's never lost, and I predict he never will, because it can't be done. Time is short, so let's look at the high points. And for that, I bring you the Resurrection <laughs> Challenge Comparatron. I guarantee you there is no other secular humanist presentation going on anywhere in this country where you will find a Comparatron. You've got to come to a Tom Flynn talk. <laughs> So let's just look at the um, high points. Who went to the tomb on Easter morning? Mark says it was Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome. Matthew says it was Mary Magdalene and, hold on tight, the other Mary. <laughs> now most scholars think this refers to Mary, the mother of James and Joses. But many other scholars think James and Joses were brothers of Jesus, so the other Mary must be the Blessed Virgin Mary. Wow, that's all the press she gets? The other Mary? <laughs> now, who does Luke say went to the tomb? Damn near everybody. <laughs> the women who had come from Galilee with Jesus, along with Mary Magdalene and Joanna, who the hell was Joanna? <laughs> and Mary, the mother of James, and, oh yes, quoting now, the other women. Wait, there's more. The Luke does not mention Peter accompanying the women to the tomb. Once the women get there, Peter suddenly gets up, what, was he sunning himself? And runs to the tomb. Finally, let's turn to the Gospel of John. John says that Mary Magdalene came to the tomb alone. Arriving separately were Peter and, quoting now, the other disciple. Oh, that helps a lot. <laughs> so that's who went to the tomb on Easter morning. Let's get back to that slide. And I, I hope that that's all clear because there will be a test afterwards. Okay, what is said about the stone that was blocking the mouth of the tomb? Mark says that when Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, arrived at the tomb, they saw that the stone had already been rolled back. Matthew isn't having any part of that. According to Matthew, when Mary Magdalene and the other Mary arrived at the tomb, now buckle your seatbelts, there was a violent earthquake, and an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled the stone away, and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. Wait a minute, there were guards? I guess Luke didn't expect to have Matthew's effects budget. When Mary Magdalene, Joanna, every woman in Jerusalem whose name includes the letter Q, and, oh yes, Peter, arrive at the tomb, the stone is, like it was in Mark, already rolled back. In John, when Peter and the other disciple arrive at the tomb, the stone hasn't just been rolled back, it's been taken away. It's gone. Or maybe it flew away. <laughs> <laughs> now let's recall one further detail. According to John, Mary Magdalene was already standing at the tomb weeping. 
So she's been there who knows how long, and apparently she never notices that the stone is missing. Who went into the tomb? Mark says Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, went straight in. Matthew won't say. In this account, the angel invites Mary Magdalene and the other women to enter, but he doesn't say whether anyone did. Gee, this could be kind of an important thing to have towards the end of your gospel. Matthew didn't bother. Nor does he say another word about those frightened guards. I guess, you know, if you're doing a movie about the resurrection, you're just because that one verse, you've got to rent all those guard uniforms and then never use them again. For his part, Luke says that Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and the rest of their all-girl entourage went on in. <laughs> Peter, who had gotten up from sunning himself and run to the tomb, just settled for stooping and looking inside without going in. John's, choreogra oh, John's choreography is so incredibly elaborate. How can I make this one? Here we go. Here's a rough floor plan of the tomb. <laughs> it has an inside and an outside. And the outside includes the cliff face, the ground leading up to the tomb, Jerusalem, the Middle East, the solar system, the Milky Way, the local group of galaxies, and so on. So everything here is not to scale. <laughs> OK, back to John's story. And don't take your eyes off the screen. You're, what you're going to see will amaze you. Mary Magdalene came to the tomb but did not enter. The other disciple ran ahead of Peter, but stopped at the mouth of the tomb. Peter caught up with him, but went into the tomb, making Peter the first to enter. Then the other disciple followed him in. Finally, and I watch, watch this carefully. This is the animation I'm proud of. Mary Magdalene stooped and looked into the tomb. <laughs> So is everyone clear on that? Uh, I, I thought of bringing John Madden with me, but you know, he always travels my boss, and you know how that is. Okay, who was seen inside the tomb? Mark says Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, saw a lone young man in a white robe sitting on the right. Matthew, apparently having worn himself out with the earthquake and the stone rolling angel and all, never describes anyone actually entering the tomb. Again, what a strange thing to leave out of your gospel. Luke says Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and their chorus line found the tomb empty. After a few moments, two men in bright, shining clothes stood by them. Peter, still standing outside, saw none of this. Okay, then Mark says one man in white, sitting, Luke says, two men standing. Who's right? Let's ask John. John says, Peter and the other disciple did not see anyone inside. Remember, Mary Magdalene is still standing outside, crying, peering into the tomb, and still not figuring out that there's no stone. She sees two angels dressed in white inside the tomb, sitting where the body had lain. The two men actually inside the tomb don't see any of that. Okay, let's check the box score. Mark says one man sitting. Luke says two men standing. John says two men sitting, but only Mary Magdalene can see them. Matthew can't be bothered. Okay, what was seen inside the tomb? Mark describes nothing aside from the seated young man. Matthew <laughs> Luke says the many, many women saw nothing other than the two standing men. Peter bent down and saw the discarded linen wrappings, but nothing else. Peter did not see the two standing men. John says the other disciple saw the linen wrappings. Peter saw the linen wrappings, but also saw the cloth that had wrapped Jesus' head rolled up a ways away from the other wrappings. None of the other evangelists mentioned that detail. And by the way, if John's description is right, the Shroud of Turin can't be the burial cloth of Jesus because John clearly says there were multiple pieces. Okay, how about Mary Magdalene? She's still outside, 
still staring in at the two angels that nobody outside, inside the tomb rather, has noticed. Okay, what was said inside the tomb? Mark says the lone seated young man tells Mag Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, not to be alarmed. Jesus has been raised. He orders them to go and tell the disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is on his way to Galilee. Remember, alone among the Gospel evangelists, Mark says <laughs> Peter did not go to the tomb. And so he uses this passage to make the story point that Peter has been forgiven for denying Jesus three times during his passion. Oh, Matthew's still <laughs> here. I believe Matthew's fallen asleep. In Luke, the two standing men tell all those many, many women that Jesus was raised on the third day, as he had said would occur. And again, there's no indication that Peter, who in Luke's gospel is standing just outside, registers any of this. Peter seems to be wholly preoccupied with those linens. John says the two angels sitting in the tomb, the ones that Peter and the other disciple failed to notice, paid no greater attention to the two men. Instead, they looked outside at Mary Magdalene and asked her why she was crying. They'd just come to the tomb of Jesus. Why did they think she's crying? Okay, was anyone seen just outside the tomb? Mark mentions no one. You'll recall that before he went into his funk, Matthew mentioned that angel who came down after the earthquake and rolled back the stone and yada, 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 as seen by Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. Luke mentions no one outside the tomb, but now hang on tight, because John is about to throw us a plot twist. Apparently Mary Magdalene, still standing outside the tomb, grows weary of being queried by the two seated angels inside the tomb, whom only she can see. For no stated reason, she turns around, and it's a good thing she did, because standing there right behind her was Jesus Christ! <laughs> Jesus tells her, 
do not hold on to me. So I guess she ran up and held on to it. Because I have not yet gone to the Father, but I go to my brothers and tell them that I am returning to him who is my Father. See, the Jesus of the Gospel of John isn't going to waste his time mucking about in Galilee. He's off to heaven. It's unclear what became of Peter and the other disciple, who remain inside the tomb, obsessing over linens, and continuing not to notice two angels, to say nothing of the risen Son of Man, perhaps with his groundskeeping implements, standing just outside. Now, Peter shows up again near the end of John's Gospel, so we're left to presume that sooner or later, Peter and his nameless companion got tired of staring at gauze and went home. Or it's possible that around sunset, those frightened guards that Matthew mentioned only once toddled over to the Gospel of John and told Peter and the other disciples that it really wasn't a safe thing for them to be seen hanging around the tomb after nightfall. Who knows? Okay, it's time for everyone to take Dan Barker's Resurrection Challenge. In simple declarative sentences, and depending on the four divinely inspired biographers of Jesus Christ as our sole authorities, what happened at the tomb on Easter morning? Don't all answer at once. <laughs> By the way, the Gospels go on contradicting one another as the story of Easter unfolds. Mark, Matthew, and Luke all present incompatible accounts of to whom the risen Jesus appeared and when and where. I mean, isn't that something you think they try to get right? Having given us the only Gospel in which Jesus appears to anyone right outside the tomb, John joins the party and presents yet a fourth incompatible account of when, where, and to whom Jesus appeared. And the incompatibilities continue in the Gospels and in the Acts of the Apostles, right through the Ascension and Pentecost, including dueling accounts of how Jesus founded his church and what instructions he gave to his disciples for the evangelization of the world. Well, now let's turn to another theological conundrum. If the Easter story were true, if it actually were the tale of how humanity was redeemed, what would that say about God? In what follows, I'm indebted to Professor Peter W. Spurlick, who submitted to Free Inquiry one of the most amazing analyses of the atonement narrative I've ever seen. We published it in the uh, February-March issue this year. So what does the Easter story say about God the Father? And I'm quoting from Spurlick's paper now. So we are confronted with a God who begot a son who he knew would be killed, which would grieve him. Then why did he allow the killing to take place? The first answer is because he wanted to save the world. But this is not sufficient. The sole and omnipotent ruler of the universe could have found other means for mankind's salvation. For example, simply say, I forgive your sins. That he did not make use of such much more benign alternatives suggests the presence and intervention of an external entity. If the sacrificial death of Christ was not simply a volitional act but on the part of God, who decided that men could be saved only by the sacrifice of God's Son? Who made this rule? There had to be a yet greater power which could compel this price. It follows that there's another force, another God in the universe. No more monotheism. Secondly, it follows that Yahweh is not the most powerful being in the universe. Something or someone else can force Yahweh to do things which are not of his own will. So, no more omnipotence. End of quote. Well, we've entertained some most unorthodox ideas about God, ideas that traditional Christians ought to find immensely disturbing, and they bubble up all by themselves when we simply try to figure out what in heaven, literally, Father and Son were up to on that long-ago Easter morning. 
Assuming, of course, that either of them really exists. So what is the trouble with Easter? From its links with agricultural generation and sexuality, to its pagan baggage, to the incomparable incoherence of its presentation in the four Gospels, Easter is simply an unholy mess. If there were a God who had mismade his creations, repented of punishing them, and felt compelled to kill his own son for spite before he grant his creations a hope of pardon, if the resurrection of Jesus was the unrivaled anchor point of all history, if any of that were true, don't you think God could have done a better job than this of setting up the anniversary <laughs> observance? So in light of all this, what can be said of Easter and the non-religious? Well, in my book, The Trouble with Christmas, I urge atheists, free thinkers, and secular humanists to take some pretty specific actions. Not that very many people have taken them. I urge the non-religious to make themselves visible at holiday time by openly boycotting the festival, pressing employers to let them work on December 25th, and making their homes conspicuous by their lack of seasonal finery. I urge parents not to burden their children with the myth of Santa Claus, belief in which may be psychologically harmful and may predispose young adults to embrace later whoppers about, oh, God and salvation and such. But when it comes to Easter, I can't quite bring myself to call for that much militancy. I mean, for one thing, Easter always falls on a Sunday. So not that many of us would get the chance to make a point by demanding to work that day. The Easter Bunny tradition may be silly, but there's little evidence that it holds the toxic sway over young minds that some researchers think the Santa myth might. I suppose that in cultures of plenty plagued by epidemic obesity and heart disease, we might cluck disapprovingly at a holiday that urges revelers to gorge themselves on chocolate bunnies and hard-boiled eggs. But as sentinels on the wall between church and state, unbelievers can take up one serious mission at this time of year, and that is we can fight for repeal of state and local laws that establish Good Friday as a legal holiday, a pretty grievous imposition on non-Christians. I just saw in the, uh, uh, in the news this morning that uh, uh, the Vatican uh, dragged one concession out of the still communist government in Cuba in honor of the Pope's visit. They made Good Friday a legal holiday in Cuba. So if your municipality has a Good Friday as a legal holiday, you can say to your city council or whoever it is, oh, you guys are just like Castro then. Okay, cool. <laughs> and the other thing we can do is we can have a little fun. Me, between noon and three every Good Friday, I go out of my way to make a little extra noise. <laughs> go out in the parking lot, roll down your windows, turn up the radio, check out your car alarm, you know, have some fun. <laughs> you know, on your key fob, you have that little red button called Panic. You ever wonder what it does? Good Friday, stroke at noon, time to find out. Okay, finally, what is the future of Easter? Now, in societies where Christians enjoy ever smaller majorities, and where Christians must coexist with citizens of many other faiths and none, the presumption that Christmas is a holiday in which, pardon me, the presumption that Easter is a holiday in which everyone must participate may gradually lose its luster. In the long term, I suspect that Easter in its age-old pagan role as spring festival may eventually fall from favor. Now, in the trouble with Christmas, I made the same long-term prediction about Christmas and for the same reason. And yes, I know how a great many people received that prediction. <laughs> But consider that Christmas in its aspect as a winter festival and Easter in its aspect as a spring fertility feast, they share historic roots that only resonate in the northern temperate zones. These holidays only work where winter builds to full force in December and the green things return in March or April. Yet today we live in an increasingly global society. 
Though we Northerners still produce and waste more than our share of light, teeming billions of us live in tropical latitudes where there's no such thing as winter, where the green things never stop growing, where two or three crops a year are the norm, and solstices don't mean a darn thing. Many others live in the South Temperate Zones, where Christmas heralds high summer, and Easter the coming of fall. So on some level, Christians in Latin America, and Africa, and Oceania, are bound to find this clash between the actual seasons and the holiday seasonal symbolism jarring. Recall also that Latin America and Africa are home to the fastest growing Christian population. Before long, these regions are going to contain thumping majorities of all the world's Christians. And sooner or later, they're going to tire of Easter's vestigial northern temperate imperialism. And these new Christian majorities in the South will demand holidays that speak more sensitively to the tempo of life as they know it. Very possibly, then, the trouble with Easter is only beginning. Well, show's over, everybody go home. Thank you very much.